Good morning and welcome to the First Colony Church of Christ. So glad all of you are here. Today we are beginning a new series that we're simply calling Sovereign. Uh, There is a presidential election around the corner. Maybe you've heard about that. There's a lot of fear and anxiety that is rising right now. And let me just say that if, if you're among those who are feeling that fear and that anxiety that's rising, you, you are not alone. Our country is divided. People have strong opinions. There are real problems that need to be addressed. And I think all of us would agree that we want our government to function in a better way. We live in a a wonderful country, don't we? A wonderful country where we have, as citizens, we have the right and we have the opportunity to vote. We have a voice and a choice in choosing those who serve in office. I think it's worth noting, though, that for the better part of the last 2,000 years, Christians haven't had that right, haven't had that opportunity, haven't had that voice or that choice. But we're blessed to live in a place and in a time where we do. And that, that really is a blessing. But that leaves many of us with more questions than answers, questions that need to be asked and answered, questions that maybe this is the most important question. How do we, as followers of Jesus, how do we live faithfully in this moment? How do we live faithfully as followers of Jesus in a moment like this. I was young at the time, so I don't really have very many memories of this. Some of you may, a lot of you may not, but Walter Cronkite was an iconic American broadcast journalist, maybe best known as the anchor of the CBS Evening News from 1962 to 1981. Often he's referred to as the most trusted man in America at the time. Cronkite was renowned for his calm, authoritative style of reporting the news. And he did that during some of the most pivotal times in modern history. He once said this about his job as a journalist. He said, our job is only to hold up the mirror, to tell and show the public what has happened. And I don't know about you, but right now as we look into that mirror, there is cause for concern. As we look into that mirror and we see what's happening around us, we see what's happening in our country, we realize our world, our world is broken. Our country is divided. There's nothing quite like a presidential election to bring out the best in people and the worst in people. We're living in a culture of contempt. Things are clearly not the way they are supposed to be. And we cry out to God. We cry out to God because of all the things that we see happening in the world around us. We see the injustice. We see the violence. We see the things that are happening. And we cry out to God. And it seems sometimes as if nothing is happening. And we wonder if God is even listening, we wonder. We wonder, where is God? Where is God when our presidential candidates are always under the threat of assassination? Where is God when it seems like school shootings are a regular occurrence? Where is God when everywhere we look is violence? Where is God when it it seems like Everywhere we turn, people would rather argue and fight than have a respectful conversation. Where is God when all we see is injustice? Where righteous people who are trying to do the right things the right way, by the way, it just seems like they're outnumbered. It feels like we're outnumbered. On the one hand, we remember, like, this is why we need good government. This is why we need good government. We need good government to uphold the law. We need good government to hold people accountable, to protect the innocent, to provide for our citizens, to keep the peace. And and let me just pause for a moment and say this. Like I know we have people in our church, people in this room, who you serve in our government. You serve in law enforcement. You uh, You serve in different ways in our community. And we want to say thank you for what you do. 
Thank you for what you, yes, thank you for what you do. Thank you for what you do. And let me also add to that, we need you. We need you and we need people like you. We need your Christian influence in our government, in our community, and in our world. We do. You know, I think we would all agree that as we look at the situation around us, it leaves us with this question. It leaves us to wonder, how do we live faithfully as followers of Jesus in this cultural moment? And not just that, but what do we do when we believe that God is in control? When we believe he is sovereign over all? Or at least we want to believe that. But everywhere we look, it seems like this, the things we see in the world around us challenge that belief. Even though it feels like it, this is a new problem, even though it feels like things have never been this way before, the truth is that the people of God have often turned to God in times like these. The truth is throughout history, the people of God have wrestled with these kinds of questions, wrestled with the problem of why things are not the way they are supposed to be and wondered how are we supposed to live faithfully in times like these, in moments like this? How do we live faithfully when it feels like the world is on fire? In fact, I want to I share some words with you this morning from Scripture, and I'll tell you where they're from in a moment, but, but at first, just... Just listen to these words, these ancient words from Scripture. Hear the word of the Lord. How long, O Lord, must I call for help? But you do not listen. Violence is everywhere, I cry, but you do not come to save. Must I forever see these evil deeds? Why must I watch all this misery? Wherever I look, I see destruction and violence. I am surrounded by people who love to argue and fight. The law has become paralyzed, and there is no justice in the courts. The wicked far outnumber the righteous, so that justice has become perverted. Okay, were those words written yesterday for us? <laughs> or were those words written at a different time for a different people? If you go back some 2,600 years, these are words that you'll find written by a prophet by the name of Habakkuk. And he's writing about a time in which he's living. He's holding up the mirror and he's telling God, hey, this is what I'm seeing. He's describing his situation and his context. One commentator who was trying to help us understand the, the day, the time, the context in which Habakkuk lived described his situation, his context this way. Listen to this. He writes, from the political leaders to the common people, everyone seems to have plunged themselves into moral madness. Everyone seems to have forsaken the Lord and his covenant with his people. Everyone seems to be striving for personal pleasure and self-promotion. At every level of society, sin is rampant. Again, were these words written yesterday for us and for our time? Or were they written for the days of Habakkuk in the time in which he lived some 2,600 years ago? I say all that to say this. It's easy for us to think. Things have never been this way before. Things have never been this bad before. But sometimes I think it's good to push pause and to look back as we strive to look forward in faith and to remember this eternal truth. The kingdoms rise and kingdoms fall. Rulers rise and rulers fall. But God is still on the throne. God is still on the throne. And I can say that today in full confidence because I know that's not only true today, that was true some 2,600 years ago when the prophet Habakkuk cried out to God about all the trouble, about all the corruption, about all the tension, about all the division, about all the confusion, about all the injustice, about all the sin that was running rampant in his day and time. And I want you to hear this morning what the Lord says 
to Habakkuk. In fact, and if you have your Bible or maybe the Version Bible app, let me invite you this morning to go ahead and open to Habakkuk. We'll start in chapter 1. If you have a paper Bible, it may be hard to find. It's a three-chapter prophecy located near the end of your Old Testament. If you have your device, you should be able to pull it up quickly. I want you to hear this because chapter 1, it sets up the scene for us. Uh, this message we're about to hear is actually a vision that Habakkuk has from God. And what follows in this prophecy is a dialogue between Habakkuk and God. Habakkuk makes his complaints known to God and then God responds. But but God's response, it's, it's not anything like what Habakkuk expected. And it may not be what you expect either. Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 2. Listen to what Habakkuk cries out to God. Hear these words again. Verse 2, how long, O Lord, must I call to help, call for help? But you do not listen. Violence is everywhere, I cry, but you do not come to save. And then God responds in verse 5. And listen to what God says. God says, Look around at the nations, Habakkuk. Look around and be amazed. For I am doing something in your own day, something you wouldn't believe, even if someone told you about it. I am raising up the Babylonians, a cruel and violent people. And they will march across the world and conquer other lands. They are notorious for their cruelty and do whatever they like. Their horses are swifter than cheetahs and fiercer than wolves at dusk. Their charioteers charge from far away. Like eagles, they swoop down to devour their prey. On they come, all bent on violence. Their hordes advance like a desert wind, sweeping captives ahead of them like sand. They scoff at kings and princes and scorn all their fortresses. They simply pile up ramps of earth against their walls and capture them. They sweep past like the wind and are gone. But they are deeply guilty, for their own strength is their God. Now, if I had to guess what Habakkuk wanted to hear from God in this moment, is exactly the same thing you would want to hear or I would want to hear whenever we cry out to God for help. What you want to hear in a moment like this is you want to hear a moment of hope. You want to know that God hears you, that God understands what you're going through. He sees your situation and that help is on the way. But but that is not the response that Habakkuk gets from God. Not even close. Babylonia is the new superpower of the ancient Near East at this time. And and God is going to do the unthinkable. Instead of sending help, he's going to employ the Babylonians as his instrument of divine judgment against his people, Judah. Instead of a word of hope, Habakkuk hears a word of divine judgment. Judgment. And it's at this point, Habakkuk is asking God the same question that you have asked God a thousand times Why? Why, God? Why would you allow this to happen to us? Habakkuk is he's struggling to reconcile what he believes to be true about God with this word that he's hearing from God. He's he's trying to make sense of the age-old question. How can a good God allow bad things to happen, especially to his own people? Listen to what Habakkuk says back to God, verse 12. O Lord, my God, my Holy One, you who are eternal, surely... Surely you do not plan to wipe us out. O Lord, our rock, you have sent these Babylonians to correct us, to punish us for our many sins. But but you are pure and you cannot stand the sight of evil. Will you wink at their treachery? Should you be silent while the wicked swallow up people more righteous than they? Habakkuk, he can't wrap his mind around God's response. God, are you really going to do this? You're really going to wipe out Your people, you're really going to allow us to suffer, allow the Babylonians to conquer us? What are we supposed to do? And that's the question, isn't it? 
That's the question all of us are asking right now. That's the question that people of God have been asking in every time, in every nation, in every generation. When they come up against hard things like this, God, what are we supposed to do? What are we supposed to do when it feels like the world is on fire, when, when things are not the way they are supposed to be, when, when we're crying out to you for help, but it seems like nothing is changing, where everywhere we look there is violence, where everywhere we look there is anger, there is hate, there is rage, there is sin, there is tension, there is division. When it feels like the, the wicked outnumber the righteous, God, what are we supposed to do? And God... God has an answer for Habakkuk, and I believe it's an answer that we need to hear today as well. In fact, I would encourage you to underline this verse, highlight this, screenshot this. This, this is the message for today. This is your word for today. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4. This is what God says. He says, but the righteous will live by their faithfulness to God. What are we supposed to do? God says the righteous will live by their faithfulness to God. God calls his people who are called by his name to live by faith even in the most desperate of times. Even in the most uncertain of situations. Even when everyone from political leaders to the common people seem to have plunged themselves into moral madness. Even when everyone seems to have forsaken and forgotten God and forgotten his covenant with his people. Even when everyone seems to be striving for personal pleasure and self-promotion. Even when at every level of our society sin is running rampant, we are called to live by faith. And we're called to remember that come what may on this earth, this is the eternal reality in heaven. Habakkuk 2 verse 20, hear this. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. Let me just read those words over you one more time. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. In other words, the kingdom of heaven is still standing. And God is still on the throne. And God is not worried. Now, I don't mean to say that that God is not unconcerned, that God is somehow unaware, that God is somehow okay with what's happening or the way things are. No, God sees, God knows, God cares. I believe that is absolutely true. But you should know that God, God is not pacing the streets of heaven this morning, worried about what's going to happen next. God is not stressed out over who's going to win this next election. He's not laying awake at night, wondering about all the what-ifs that keep you and me awake at night. No, the Lord, Yahweh is his name. He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. And he is in his holy temple. And whenever you step into his presence, whenever you come before the great I am, whenever you approach the eternal one, whenever you see the Lord high and lifted up like Habakkuk did that day some 2,600 years ago, you may, like him, you may want to choose your next words very carefully. In fact, you may want to be silent before him. Be silent before him. Be silent. After this, after God speaks, Habakkuk falls silent before the Lord. He remembers who he is and who God is. And in that moment, Habakkuk's complaint turns. And it becomes a prayer of praise. 
Now, watch this. Remember this. His situation hasn't changed. The Babylonians are still on the way, but his perspective has changed. And as you turn the page to chapter 3, what you find there is a psalm, a song of worship, a prayer of praise. And I want you to hear these words that Habakkuk writes as a prayer of praise to God. In verse 2, he says, I have heard all about you, Lord, and I am filled with awe by your amazing works. In this time of our deep need, help us again as you did in years gone by. And in your anger, remember your mercy. I see God moving across the deserts from Edom, the Holy One coming from Mount Paran. His brilliant splendor fills the heavens and the earth is filled with his praise. His coming is as brilliant as the sunrise. Rays of light flash from his hands where his awesome power is hidden. Pestilence marches before him. Plague follows close behind. When he stops, the earth shakes. When he looks, the nations tremble. He shatters the everlasting mountains and levels the eternal hills. He is the eternal one. And maybe today you're feeling a little anxiety and fear surrounding this election in our country. Maybe there are deep emotions that are stirring within you as you think about the implications. I know. I feel it too. God knows. But today, can I just encourage you to pray this prayer? Listen to how Habakkuk concludes this prayer. Verse 17, he says, even though, even though the fig trees have no blossoms and there are no grapes on the vines, even though the olive crop fails and the fields lie empty and barren, even though the flocks die in the fields and the cattle barns are empty. In other words, even though things are as bad as they could possibly be, even though my first my, my worst fears are being realized, even though Habakkuk says, verse 18, yet I, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. The sovereign Lord, the sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes me as sure-footed as a deer, able to tread upon the heights. Habakkuk resolves in this moment, to trust in the sovereignty of God, even in the midst of uncertain times. He resolves to trust in the goodness and the sovereignty of God. Even though he doesn't understand what's happening. Even though he can't see how God is working. Even though he makes this decision to put his trust in the goodness of God and the sovereignty of God. He can do that. Because the Lord is seated on his throne. He can do that because the Lord is in his holy temple. And you can too. Just like Habakkuk. You can cry out to God when you see all the injustice. When you see the division. When you feel the tension. When you experience the confusion. When you look around and you see the violence, you see the sin, you see the hurt, you see the harm, you see the pain. You can cry out to God when you see all that happening in the world around you. And just like Habakkuk, you can trust. You can trust that God is working in ways that you can see and often in ways that you cannot see. God is working to make all things right and all things new. In 1863, our country was experiencing another time of deep division. In fact, you might say it was the most divided time in the history of our nation. It was a different time, different circumstances, but our country was in the middle of a civil war. At this point, the war had been raging for some two years. Many people say that this was the deadliest war in all of our American history. The toll, the toll that it was taking on our country, the cost of life, the bloodshed, it was unimaginable. At that time, 
Abraham Lincoln was the president of the United States. And he had the strong conviction that our nation needed to turn to God for, for guidance, for repentance, and for healing. So on March 30th, 1863, President Abraham Lincoln issued a proclamation for a national day of prayer, fasting, and humiliation, calling our nation to seek God during one of the most challenging times in our history. In that proclamation, Lincoln wrote these words. He said, we have been the recipients of the choicest bounties of heaven. We have been preserved these many years in peace and prosperity. We have grown in numbers, wealth, and power as no other nation has ever grown. But we have forgotten God. Once again, let me ask, were those words written yesterday for us? or for different people in a different time. They feel as true today as ever before. How do we live faithfully? How do we live faithfully as followers of Jesus in this current cultural moment? What do you do when you believe that God is in control, that God is sovereign, that God is in all things and over all things, yet when you look around At the world around you, it feels like that belief is being challenged by all the division and all the tension and all the sin that's running rampant. What do you do? How do we live faithfully as followers of Jesus in this current cultural moment today? Can I encourage you? In a world that has forgotten God, can I encourage you to remember? In a world that has forgotten God, can I encourage you to remember that God has always been and will always be sovereign. That that even in the face of uncertain times, even when we are filled with anxiety and fear, even when we don't know what's going to happen next, we can know that this is true, this is eternally true, that God is sovereign. The Lord is in his holy temple. He sees He knows and he cares for us. And come what may, the Lord is still on the throne today. And whenever you feel overwhelmed, whenever you feel like this political moment is confusing and disorienting and you don't know what to do and you begin to wonder, where is God, can I encourage you? Instead of typing in all caps on social media, Instead of allowing politics to separate you from the people that you love most. Instead of allowing our enemy to sow his seeds of division and tension in our families and in our churches. Can I encourage you instead to choose to be silent before the Lord. In fact, maybe the best thing you could do is just take a few moments, a few minutes every day and just sit in silence before the Lord and remember who is on the throne. Can I encourage you to make a decision to live your life by faith and to live life faithfully? Can I encourage you to be salt and light in this world. Can I encourage you to love your neighbor, to forgive those who hurt you? Can I encourage you to be the hands and the feet of Jesus? Can I encourage you to choose to be different, to follow the way of Jesus, who chose to follow the way of cross, who chose to follow the way of the cross for you? To follow the way of Jesus, who chose to follow the way of the cross for you and for me.